April 10th, 1912. The Titanic sails from Southampton, England to begin a seven-day crossing to New York. Titanic is commanded by Captain Edward J. Smith, a respected English seaman with 40 years experience. Titanic's odyssey begins with a sprint across the English Channel to Cherbourg in France. Here, most of her first-class passengers come aboard. Many are wealthy North American tourists, eager to be part of history. Awestruck travelers already are calling her the Millionaire's Special. There's a swimming pool, a gymnasium, a Parisian sidewalk cafe, and staterooms furnished with French antiques. The passenger list includes many of the world's most celebrated tycoons, John Jacob Astor, Benjamin Guggenheim, fabled men of fabulous wealth. Isidore Strauss and his wife Ida owners of Macy's department store. Charles M. Hayes, president of Canada's transcontinental railroad. Government officials such as Major Archibald Butt, aide and confidant of President William Howard Taft. Titanic's most expensive stateroom goes to John Jacob Astor IV, owner of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. But Astor's image has been tarnished by a scandalous divorce and his remarriage to 19-year-old Madeline Force. Now, with Madeline five months pregnant, Astor decides to return home on the Titanic to reclaim his supremacy in East Coast society. From Cherbourg, the millionaire special steams to Queenstown, Ireland to take on passengers of a far different social rank. They are emigrants, fleeing poverty and hopelessness. Among the refugees, 16-year-old Kate Gilnott, second oldest child of an Irish peasant family of 10. Kate has decided to join her elder sister, Molly, in New York. With her, in her cramped third-class cabins, are 700 other emigrants from dozens of nations. Each room had four bunks with a wash basin, soap, and towels between them. These poorest passengers are housed in the belly of the ship, four decks below the millionaire's promenade. Cut off from the rest of the ship, by ropes and regulations, lest they infect the privileged with the diseases of the destitute. In fact, Titanic's owners are counting on the immigrant trade for their profits. Then she turns seaward as Titanic leaves sight of land forever. As she steers for New York, Titanic carries the ambitions of the Titanic capitalist who owns her, John Pierpont Morgan. Already famous and feared for buying up railroads and steel companies, he now seeks to rule the ocean. But J.P. Morgan is too ill to make the maiden voyage. It is a sickness that will save his life. On the North Atlantic, the shipping lanes are littered with giant bergs and floating sheets of ice. But her owners have asked Captain Smith to make a fast crossing to New York. A 
After all, there's nothing this ship cannot handle. For the first four days, the voyage is idyllic. Passengers settle into shipboard routine. Formal dress and continental cuisine make for enchanted evenings. But four decks below, the roar of the engines and the roll of the giant ship confine young Kate Gilnar to her windowless cabin. By Sunday, April 14th, Titanic's maiden voyage is more than half over. Captain Smith and designer Andrews agree to test her engines at top speed the following morning. Newfoundland is now within range of Titanic's wireless radio. In 1912, radio means Morse code signals with a range of only a few hundred miles. Titanic's machine is operated by 21-year-old Harold Bride. The wealthy passengers are fascinated with this new technology. They keep Bride busy with frivolous messages to friends and relatives ashore. At sunset on Monday, April 14th, all is well aboard the Millionaire's Special. At 10.25 p.m., a wireless operator in Newfoundland picks up a desperate cry for help. Come at once. We have struck a bird. It's CQD OM, position 4146. Operators try to contact the great ship from shore. There is no reply. sent by cable to Halifax and relayed to New York. The greatest ship in the world is sinking. At the offices of the New York Times, managing editor Carr Van Ander must quickly decide whether the ship is doomed. He decides to run the story on the front page. Word soon reaches Philip Franklin, vice president of the Titanic's parent company. I was roused by the telephone ringing. A reporter said they just heard the Titanic was sinking. I immediately called up our dock and asked them if they'd heard anything at all. Franklin spends the next few hours making frantic calls for more information. In 1912, New York and the world learn that the impossible has occurred. The Times has been so quick to rush the news to print that no one has had time to withdraw the advertisement on page 11 for the Titanic's return passage to England. In New York, other editors mock the Times for printing a mere rumor. But the news spreads. And soon, worried visitors begin to gather at the offices of the White Star Steamship Line on Broadway. Sir, Philip Franklin assures everyone that even if Titanic did ram an iceberg, she would remain afloat with her passengers unhurt. She is absolutely unsinkable, and it makes no difference what she's hit. The report should not cause any serious anxiety. As he studies Titanic's passenger list, Franklin is haunted by an inconceivable horror, the loss of more than 2,000 lives. Meanwhile, hundreds of freelance radio operators are listening for any transmissions regarding Titanic's fate. 
But this morning, as the Titanic lies broken on the ocean floor, an amateur radio operator copies down two messages from the sea. Taken together, they will inspire new hope and celebration. At noon, Philip Franklin's grim daydream is interrupted by the best imaginable news. Franklin reads the message to reporters. All Titanic passengers are safe. The Virginian towing the liner to Halifax. But what no one knows is that the radio operator has mistakenly mixed two transmissions. One, that a crippled oil tanker is being towed to Halifax. The other, that those few who did survive the Titanic sinking are safely aboard a rescue ship. The evening editions are delighted to announce that Titanic is safe and that the New York Times was wrong. Europe goes to bed Monday, confident that the demise of the great Atlantic liner is only a mirage. A thousand miles from New York, Titanic's giant sister ship, the Olympic, is about to destroy all illusions. Her message barely makes it to New York. Radio is unregulated. Airwaves are cluttered with the signals of freelance wireless operators. Ironically, this terrible news is received at Wanamaker's department store in New York. It has installed a wireless booth as a publicity stunt. At 4.35 p.m., David Sarnoff, the 21-year-old with a passion for radio, hears the Olympic report that only 675 people have survived the wreck of the Titanic. Sarnoff calls the newspapers, and again, the New York Times takes the lead. It posts bulletins on public billboards at Times Square. At the offices of the White Star Line, reporters besiege Philip Franklin for details. He holds to his fantasy. Titanic could not have sunk because it cannot sink. Then, at 6.20 p.m., the courier brings Franklin a telegram. His nightmare is real. I got off the first line and a half when it said, the Titanic sank at 2 o'clock a.m., and there was not a reporter left in the room. They were so anxious to get out to telephone the news. As evening falls, the White Star Line begins to receive visits from anxious relatives of Titanic's illustrious clientele. One of the first is Vincent Astor, son of John Jacob Astor. Vincent is 20, a freshman at Harvard. He meets privately with Philip Franklin and is told that almost all of the survivors must have been women and children. Franklin does not know is that more than 100 men have also survived. Day two, April 16th. All night, Vincent Astor haunts the offices of the Marconi Wireless Company. Why is there so little information? The rescue ship Carpathia's wireless has a range of only 400 miles. The Carpathia must rely on other ships to relay the lists of the living.
By daybreak on Tuesday, the first list of survivors is being posted all over the city. It contains 125 names, 27 of them men. With so little hard news available, the furiously competitive New York newspapers outdo each other in wild speculation. Titanic's passengers must have been thrown violently about and many injured. As the lifeboats were swung out, the British fighting blood of the officers asserted itself, armed, no doubt, with revolvers to drive back the panic-stricken male passengers. Darkness and fog added to the difficulty. Total darkness undoubtedly prevailed when the lifeboats were launched. By the dim light of oil lanterns, the Titanic's officers kept back the cowards and helped women and children to safety. The newspaper accounts are thrilling, horrifying, and almost entirely wrong. But the reports transfix the world in a global community of grief, fascination, and fear. England wakes to the crushing news. The White Star officers are besieged. Lloyds of London, the Titanic's insurer, reels from the losses. In New York, the posting of partial lists of survivors only deepens the anguish. Soon, private grief is joined by public outrage. British law has permitted the wonder ship to sail with only enough lifeboats for one half of her passengers. One millionaire's destiny is investigated personally when Mrs. Florette Guggenheim arrives to inquire after her husband, Benjamin. Benjamin Guggenheim is a mining magnet with an estimated worth of 85 million untaxed dollars. For the past eight months, he has been in Paris, accompanied by one of his many mistresses. not appear on the list of survivors. When she learns this crushing news, Florette remains composed enough to speak to reporters about the shortage of lifeboats. By Tuesday noon, squads of mounted police are brought in to keep order. Dozens of relatives of immigrant passengers arrive. The clerks can offer them nothing. The Carpathia still is ignoring all questions about the lower classes. At the White House, Taft sends out two American ships to serve as wireless relay stations for the Carpathia. But Taft is also furious that only a few hours earlier, garbled messages were suggesting that the Titanic was safe. He declares that Washington must regulate the infant broadcasting industry. Late afternoon, Vincent Astor, son of the Titanic's richest passenger, searches the survivor lists. He's devastated. He finds a stepmother's name, but there is no mention of his father. Me. 
Now, as Tuesday ends, the wireless station at Cape Race, Newfoundland, receives a grim message from the Mid-Atlantic. Confirmation that the only survivors are aboard the Carpathia. Of all the crew, only four officers and one radio operator have been rescued. Now there can be no doubt, no chance, no hope. Six hundred miles from the North American coast, the Carpathia slowly makes her way westward, carrying the living. Day three. Only the Carpathia knows who has survived and who has perished on the Titanic. New York has told only the names of the wealthiest survivors. But the New York offices of the White Star Line, Molly Gilna does not know whether her 16-year-old sister Kate is alive or dead. Here you are, boys. In Washington, Senator Alden Smith orders an investigation and rushes to New York to ensure that the ship's surviving officers do not escape American justice. On Wall Street, shares in the Marconi Wireless Company soar from $50 to $350 each. Newspaper cartoonists accuse Titanic's owners of outright murder. Journalists and desperate relatives from across the continent converge on New York. Thursday, April 18th, the Carpathia approaches New York Harbor. White Star Vice President Philip Franklin heads for the docks to confront the reality of the loss. Forty thousand spectators are at the dock along with hundreds of policemen and every off-duty nurse and doctor in the city. Banned from the dock by order of J.P. Morgan, reporters charter tugboats. 20-year-old Vincent Astor attempts to sail his own yacht to pick up his stepmother, Madeline. But permission is refused. The rich and the poor will wait together. At 8 p.m., in driving rain and lightning, the Carpathia passes the Statue of Liberty. Solemnly, she pauses at Titanic's dock and lowers the great ship's lifeboats. And now, as the dazed and weakened survivors at last reach shore, the quiet is punctured by joyous shouts of reunion and the bitter cries of those who find no one. Friday morning. There's a perverse mood of joviality on the docks as cabin boys from the Carpathia show off at the newsreel camera. The Carpathia's captain and crew are hailed as heroes. Some of the Titanic survivors are mysteries. Two French children disembark, nameless, their parents presumed dead. The scoop of the young century belongs to the New York Times. Marconi operator Harold Bride has survived by clinging to an overturned lifeboat. A big wave carried the boat off. I had hold on an oarlock and I went off with it. The next thing I knew, I was in the boat and the boat was upside down. For $1,000, he has sold his incredible story to a Times reporter. His broken feet hastily bandaged, Bride has been working for three days without sleep in the Carpathia's radio room. Now we learn the real story of what happened on that fateful night. Sunday, April 14th, 
had been a day of leisure aboard the wonder ship, with New York still three days away. Bride had been transmitting routine greetings from Titanic's wealthiest travelers. But incoming signals warn of heavy ice ahead. Other ships report that they are changing course and slowing down to avoid crossing the danger zone at night. Captain E.J. Smith steers the Titanic slightly southward and then goes to dinner. But the biggest ship in the world is still steaming at close to top speed. At 11.35, on a clear, calm, moonless night, the Titanic meets her destiny. Lookouts spot an iceberg just ahead. Immediately, First Officer William Murdoch orders a sharp turn and slams the engines into full reverse. It's a fatal mistake. The iceberg scrapes along the length of the Titanic. Bride and colleague Jack Phillips do not even sense the collision. I didn't even feel the shock. I was with Phillips when the captain put his head in the cabin. We've struck an iceberg, the captain said, and I'm having an inspection made to tell us what it has done to us. Now you better get ready to send out a call of assistance. Captain Smith has asked ship designer Thomas Andrews to go below to assess the damage. water in the cargo holds and now it's flooding into boiler room number five panic if cold water reaches the furnaces they will explode andrews returns to the bridge with his dreadful news the ship has less than two hours to live calmly the captain orders the lifeboats to be uncovered lifeboats with room for fewer than half of those on board Bride and Phillips make their first distress calls using a new international signal, SOS. The Carpathia promises assistance, but it will take her four hours to sail 60 miles through the ice fields. Phillips told me to run and tell the captain that the Carpathia had answered. I did so, and I went through a mass of people to his cabin. The decks were full of scrambling men and women. The Titanic is beginning to tilt forward. There is 32 feet of water in the hold, and time is running out. Stewards are ordered to awaken and organize the passengers. Steward James Etches arrives at the stateroom of millionaire Benjamin Guggenheim. I put a life preserver on Mr. Guggenheim. He said it hurt him in the back. There was plenty of time, and I took it off, adjusted it, and then put it on him again. Gallantly, Guggenheim and his assistant help women and children into the lifeboats. Mr. Guggenheim would shout out women first, and he was of great help to the officers. What surprised me was that both Mr. Guggenheim and his secretary were dressed in their evening clothes. We've dressed up in our best, replied Mr. Guggenheim, and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. If anything should happen to me, tell my wife in New York that I've done my best in doing my duty. But some decline to be saved. Ida Strauss refuses to leave her husband. She and her beloved Isidore sit hand in hand while panic and confusion rage all around them, awaiting their fate. The devotion of Ida Strauss remains a deeply moving chapter in the legend of the Titanic. Far below the passenger decks, the damage is now unstoppable. One crewman dies in the torrent, Titanic's first fatality. Flares are shot off. And seen by a ship just five miles away, the California. But its captain does not recognize the flares as a distress call. 
and so tragically does nothing. The beleaguered Titanic lowers 16 lifeboats to the freezing water, but several are swung away only half filled with first-class passengers. For the third-class immigrants trapped on the lower decks, there is no help, only chaos. Kate Gilnar was deep within the Titanic. She felt the iceberg immediately. We were on, standing on the steerage, third class, they call it, and um, then we couldn't get up to second. And of course, then there was one man with us, and he was our guardian angel, and he said, for God's sake, let the women up. Then I had to go to first cabin. Life boats were only going from first cabin. So there was a man on the second deck and he asked me to go on his shoulder and I climbed over and then I got, I think it was the last boat that was going out. Kate is one of the few immigrants who will survive to follow her dreams. In the Titanic's elegant salons, confusion. John Jacob Astor confronts Captain Smith, who commands him to get his wife Madeline into a lifeboat immediately. Astor asks to join his wife, pleading that she is weakened by her pregnancy. But the officer in charge will not permit any men in the lifeboats. And Astor declines to use his immense wealth to pull rank. Colonel Astor said to me, the sea is calm. You'll be all right. You're in good hand. I'll see you in the morning. John Jacob Astor will never see his young wife again. His body will be found floating a week later. By 1.55 a.m., the Titanic's stern is high in the air, but 1,500 people remain aboard. Ten minutes later, the last of the lifeboats is lowered. Harold Bride and Jack Phillips remain at their post as water begins to flood the radio room. I will never forget the work of Phillips for the last awful 15 minutes. Then came the captain's voice. Men, you have done your full duty. You can do no more. Abandon your cabin. Now it's every man for himself. Their work is done. No radio message can bring salvation now. Still, many men like railway tycoon Charles M. Hayes of Montreal are certain that the Titanic cannot possibly sink. After helping women and children into the lifeboats, Major Archibald Butt returns to the smoking lounge to engage in one last hand of cards. One other man seen in the lounge, alone and silent, Thomas Andrews, head designer of the Titanic, will die with her. At 2.18 a.m., with 1,500 passengers, officers, and crewmen of all classes and creeds still on board, The mightiest vessel ever built surrenders to the North Atlantic. The final moments are witnessed by Harold Bride, who has been swept into icy waters. The ship was a beautiful sight then. Smoke and sparks were rushing out of a funnel. 
The ship was gradually turning on her nose. The band was still playing. I guess all of the band went down. All that remains is the calm, flat sea. A few lifeboats and the pleas of the drowning. The cries of the dying continue for hours, echoed by reverent voices from a lifeboat lost amid the chaos and debris. As Monday morning breaks, the survivors find themselves in a macabre wonderland of ice. At 4 a.m., April 15th, the Carpathia begins her distressing rescue task. She's prepared to take on 3,000 people, but finds only 15 lifeboats carrying 700. survivors are numb from shock and cold. The Carpathia's captain offers his own quarters to Madeline Force Astor. Bride has broken both his feet in his miraculous escape from death. Yet by day's end, he will be back at work in the Carpathia radio room, transmitting names of survivors. Florette Guggenheim, the final chapter is written on Friday morning, as steward James Etches tells the heroic tale of the last moments of her husband's life. Shortly after, the last few boats were lowered, and I was ordered by the deck officer to man an oar. I waved goodbye to Mr. Guggenheim, and that was the last I saw of him. Guggenheim's infidelities will be forgiven. His honorable death will render him a hero to his family and the nation. Sixteen-year-old Kate Gilnell is reunited with her sister Molly. They have a photograph taken to reassure their parents back in Ireland. Vincent Astor continues to believe that his own father somehow made it to a rescue ship. But the following days bring the death of all hope, and the grim business of bringing home the dead. The coroner ship is dispatched from Halifax, Canada to retrieve bodies. The Mackay Bennett sails with a full load, 100 rough pine coffins and 100 tons of ice. Her crew finds corpses still dressed in evening clothes, many bloated beyond recognition. Even in death, the first-class passengers are given the best treatment, embalmed and lain in a coffin. The others are placed in canvas bags or buried at sea. The ship of the dead returns to Canada. An ice rink is turned into a morgue filled with boxes, each with three bodies. Some will be claimed by families and taken home. Many others will be buried in Halifax, ending their voyage in the soil of Canada.
the Seekers who arrives in Halifax is Vincent Astor. He retrieves his father's body, identified by a platinum ring and $4,000 found in his pocket. In New York, John Jacob Astor is eulogized as a hero. His reputation has finally been restored. of the French children is finally solved. They are returned to their mother in France. The children have been kidnapped by her estranged husband. At Astor's own Waldorf Astoria, the Senate inquiry begins. J.P. Morgan's man in New York, Philip Franklin, presents his version of the events. Bruce Ismay, the British head of the company, escaped in one of the lifeboats. He's condemned for not going down with the ship, as did so many. The inquest also condemns the Californian and its crew for failing to rescue Titanic. Its captain, Stanley Lord, finds his reputation ruined by the disaster. In England, another inquest condemns the company's hunger for speed and luxury and its fatal inattention to safety. John Pierpont Morgan never sailed on the ship his ambition created, but the disaster destroys him as well. He is condemned by the U.S. government for his attempts to monopolize key industries. Weakened and exhausted, the wealthiest man in America dies in 1913. On April 15, 1912, 1,500 souls were sacrificed to a dream of luxury and speed. Today it is believed that Titanic's great weakness was her steel. Made brittle by the cold, it sprang hundreds of leaks after the fatal collision. But from the disaster came a precious legacy. New laws for lifeboats, better radios, proper ice patrols, and a new future. Vincent Astor inherited $78 million, then sold off his father's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It was demolished, to be replaced by an enduring symbol of the 20th century, the Empire State Building. Kate Gilno lived in New York City until the age of 75, telling and retelling on radio and TV the story of her miraculous escape from death. Oh yes, I was looking at it thinking when we were in the lifeboat because we were in the lifeboat for nine hours. And then which ship rescued you? Carpathia. Benjamin Guggenheim's inheritance was passed to his three daughters. Peggy used her share to establish the famous Guggenheim collection of modern art. Guillermo Marconi saw wireless become one of the 20th century's first mass media. David Sarnoff, the radio operator at Wanamaker's department store, founded the national broadcasting company, NBC. Few ships have touched the lives of so many so profoundly. Still, the Titanic inspires all, lying broken at the bottom of the ocean, an eerie, eternal testament to the limits of human ambition and the power of the sea.